Can you simply excuse your bad behavior or make up for a lapse of judgment? Or do you need a savior? Today on Back to the Bible, Pastor Nat Crawford talks truth about sin and our desperate need for grace. Later, Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney will be on hand to discuss today's message and help you move forward in faith. We'll begin in just a moment, but first, remember to request the latest issue of Win the Day. This month's edition features devotions to help you walk in truth and peace. We're excited to send you a copy as a thank you for your gift to Back to the Bible. Just call 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or visit backtothebible.org. Now, here's Pastor Nat with today's message. What's the best excuse you've ever come up with? What's that reason you've given to excuse bad behavior in your life? As a parent, I think I've probably heard virtually every excuse in the book for such a wide variety of both sin and simple accidents. Now, I don't know if you pay much attention to the news, but there was a recent politician that was caught on camera breaking a mandate that she had declared imperative, and that those who wouldn't follow it should be punished. But when caught... Immediately, there was an excuse and even deflection. Now, here's the problem with excuses. Excuses do not deal with or remedy the problem. We can give great reasons why the car is now around a tree. Uh, We can give great excuses as to why there was paraphernalia found in the car. We can provide years worth of evidence of good behavior, but that doesn't excuse the momentary lapse of judgment. Again, the problem is an excuse does not remedy the problem. In order to fix the problem, we need a fixer. And there is no greater problem that we face than our sin. Can we save ourselves? Can we excuse our bad behavior? Can we erase the lapse of judgment with a history of obedience, or do we need a Savior? That's what we want to talk about today in the book of Galatians, beginning in chapter 2, verse 14. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Well, here in verse 14, Paul calls out Peter in front of everyone. Now, some people may say, whoa, 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 that is not appropriate, Paul. I mean, what's your problem? I mean, doesn't the Bible, I mean, doesn't Jesus tell us to correct people in private? Well, if you ask that, I'm glad that you're reading your Bible. Yes, Jesus did say that. But here's the difference. What happened here with Peter and Paul It was a public act. Peter's compromise was influenced by others, but more importantly, it influenced others to sin as well. When we sin publicly and hurt people, it is perfectly appropriate to call out and address the sin publicly. This is not to shame people, not to drag them through the mud. This isn't even to ruin their reputation. What we are doing is showing that we really care about the body of Christ. We are trying to make the wrong things right. That's exactly what Paul does with Peter. And then Paul says he saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This literally means to walk upright, but I think we can probably just think of it as walking in a way consistent with the truth or reality. We have to remember that Paul says, you are free. Live as free. Don't go back to slavery of any kind, whether it's to the law, an addiction, or anything else. He says, Peter, remember you are free. These people around you, they are free. Don't tell them in your actions to live like a slave. 
Paul continues in verse 15 by saying, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Paul will say we four times in the next three verses. Whenever he says we, he is talking about himself, Peter, and any Jewish Christians. You see, these are people who are born Jewish. Now, that's pretty straightforward. But then he says, and not Gentile sinners. Now, as I read that, I thought, that sounds a little odd, Paul, if not just a little bit offensive. But what Paul is not saying is that Jews were sinless. He wasn't necessarily saying that Gentiles were in a special class of sinners. What he was referring to is that Gentiles were people born without the law. According to Jews, Gentiles were sinners by nature because they had no law to guide them in proper living and in pleasing God. So again, this had nothing to do with one people group being sinless and another people group being sinful. It's true that the Jews were God's chosen people. They were children of the Abrahamic covenant, but they were still sinners. The difference between Gentiles and Jews, as Paul is referring to here, is the physical law that guided them. I think we need to be really careful to never forget that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. You see, this religious elite, they would point back to their heritage. Remember, that's what Paul did in Philippians. He said, hey, I am a Jew of the Jews. I, I was born in the right family. I have the right degrees. Uh, look at my background. Uh, look at what I've accomplished. But then he does something remarkable. He flips the script on its head and says, all that stuff that I used to bank on, it's garbage. It's garbage. It means nothing because ultimately, nothing we do and nothing from our past or even our ancestry can save us. Ultimately, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that saves. That was true for Paul, and it's true for you and me today. We'll be back with more of today's message. But first, here's a word from Pastor Nat about this month's issue of Win the Day. The headlines are pretty disturbing right now. In the midst of political division and civil unrest, we're still fighting a mysterious virus. But take heart, this won't last forever. The Prince of Peace is coming, and I've put together a series of devotionals to remind you of the truth and peace you can experience in Jesus right now. You'll find these encouraging devotions in the October issue of Win the Day, and we're looking forward to sending you a copy as a thank you for your gift to Back to the Bible. Make your request at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or if you prefer to give online, visit backtothebible.org. Backtothebible.org. Now here's more of today's message with Pastor Nat. So Paul has just reminded Peter and us today that our background doesn't matter. We are all sinners. It doesn't matter if we were born with the Bible, the Jewish Torah, or no religious literature at all. The reality is, according to Romans, we all have a moral law written on our hearts. It's not having the religious literature or the law that condemns us. It's our very sin that condemns us. You see, it has nothing to do with our background. It has nothing to do with our performance. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. Paul really hits this home with this message in verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul has just said in three different ways that we are not saved because of what we can do, 
but rather we are justified by what Christ has done. No amount of rule following can make a person righteous before God. Justified is a legal term that means to be declared righteous or without blame. It's like a judge hitting his gavel and saying, I find no fault in this man or this woman. They may go. So Paul says a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. No one can be saved by their good works. Why? Because the Bible declares it and history confirms it. The Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not even one. No one seeks after God. In Ephesians 2, it tells us that we are all sinners and we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But Paul, couldn't we just do a little bit of work to get ourselves out of this sin trap that we suffer from? Well, here's how I like to think about it. Uh, imagine with me, if you would, that you are driving down the street and you see the light changing from green to yellow and then to red. So what do you do? You gun it. I mean, you just blow through the red light and the next thing you know, you hear the sirens. You look up and you see the lights and sure enough, ah, a cop is in your rear view mirror. So what do you do? You know you're late for a doctor's appointment. You can try to justify your sin, right? Well, let's see how this plays out. The cop comes up, he asks for your information, and he says, do you realize that you were speeding? And what do you say? You want to be honest. You say, yes, of, of course I do. I recognize I was speeding. But you don't understand. I'm late for my doctor's appointment, and I just didn't think it was a big deal. Well, the police officer says, well, you know what? It is a big deal. It's illegal for you to go through a red light. And now that you've mentioned you're speeding to get there, that's a double whammy. But then you figured it out. You say, oh, okay, okay, copper, you're right. I, I did speed. I did blow through a red light. However, do you realize... I live over three miles away from here. And up to this point, I didn't speed. I didn't even go through any red lights. I've done a really good job until just now. So will you let me go? Pretty please? Well, the police officer, who is serious about the law and a good cop, he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's great that you obeyed the law up until this point. However, you broke the law. You broke the law, and now I must write you a ticket. You see, we cannot excuse our bad behavior with the good behavior we've done. That won't save us from our sin, and it surely won't get us out of a ticket from a cop. This is why Paul says in verse 16 that we know, we know that a person is not justified or declared righteous by works of the law. It doesn't matter how many green lights you went through if you end up going through that red light in the end. It doesn't matter if you drove 35 miles per hour for the last three miles, but in the last mile you barreled it at 75. We are not justified by works of the law, but instead through Jesus Christ. But because Paul knows how we operate as humans, he says it again in a different way, just to see if we'll get it. Paul says, So we also believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. You see, he kind of shifts it from a general tone to more personal. He says, It's not about them out there. He says, It's about you. It's about me. Paul says, we as Jewish Christians, we had the law. <laughs> we knew the law, and yet we still sinned against the law. We got to quit thinking that our good behavior in the past, no matter how many times we went to the synagogue or temple, no matter how many sacrifices we offered, no matter how many tithes and offerings we gave, we still stood condemned. We can't buy our salvation. 
We can't win our salvation. The only way to experience it is through Jesus Christ. When I read Paul's words, I feel like Paul is shouting at us today. It's as if he's saying, quit playing the game of religion. Quit trying to save yourself. Quit trying to play God. You cannot give enough money to your church. You cannot give enough money away to save yourself. It doesn't work. Paul is saying, quit thinking that if you go to church every Sunday, that gives you some type of extra merit in your salvation. Paul is saying, quit thinking when you are scheduled for eight hours a day, that if you work for seven and a half hours straight, you get to take the last 30 minutes and play Candy Crush. That behavior is not dismissed. I feel like Paul is shouting at us, telling us that just because you teach a Bible study once a week, or you're a small group leader in your youth group, that use of pornography on occasion is dismissed. Friend, there is nothing we can do to excuse our sin. There is nothing we can do on a cosmic spiritual scale that tips the scale in our favor. There is nothing we can do. No matter of religion, no amount of performance, no amount of track record can save us from our sin. In case you and I aren't getting it, Paul says it one more time. He says, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Whenever something is repeated in the Bible, it means, listen up. It's like putting it in bold and in caps. Paul is saying, take this seriously. Quit dismissing it or ignoring it. Listen up. Paul is saying, this isn't a guessing game. It's not a lottery. It's not a pay-per-play. No. Listen to me. If you want to be declared righteous, in other words, free from sin before a holy God, you cannot achieve it by your works. Your good behavior will not excuse away your sin. The only way to salvation, the only way to peace with God, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood covers our sins. And because he was buried and rose again, we have true life. Three times Paul has said in this one verse, we are not saved by our works. We cannot excuse our sin away. We cannot buy our salvation. Salvation comes freely by grace through faith alone. The question for you and me today is, will we believe it enough to live it? So let me go to Arnie and Kara now. Kara, what happens when you start to think that you earn your way to salvation? Read my Bible, Nat. You know, there's a few people in the Bible that I never want to be. And uh, Job's buddies come to mind. Hmm. I always think about Job's buddies. I don't want to be them. Don't right. overtalk. <laughs> and then the other is the prodigal son's older brother. So I don't want to be standing outside criticizing everybody else uh, while they're in there enjoying the freedom they get out of their salvation. Mm. So I read the Bible. It's a good reminder. Uh, I am free. My salvation is secure. So, But I'm just curious. You know, it seems like people are so bent towards religion. I've talked about this for a couple of weeks now. People just keep going back to religion, and it's that way of legalism. Why do you think people are so attracted to it, even Christians? Because I think we question things. I mean, I'm not saying being a Christian is easy. I'm not saying that at all. I think it's, uh, it's extremely difficult. Uh, but our salvation is easy to achieve because the one that did all the work did all the work with Jesus Christ. And hmm. so we just have to accept that gift. That's it. Right. I think we're always looking for a catch, right? Hmm. Because in the world, there is there is always a catch. But uh, in this case... I agree. Well, and speaking of grace, Arnie, grace puts everyone on the same level. That is the fix for that religion. That's the fix for the legalism. So why is grace so important? 
oftentimes I think legalism prevails when people want to feel better than someone else. Hmm. And pride gets in the way. And I, I see it a lot in the Christian culture, if you will, holier than thou or better. And Jesus Christ came and was the great leveler. I mean, we've all sinned and fallen short. And so nobody's better than anybody else. And when people start going down that path, they're actually condemning other people or not wanting them to have Jesus in their hearts. It's such a tremendous harm to people when you don't accept grace that we've all sinned and it places all of us on the same level. We're not better than other people. It's critical. Hmm. I think that's interesting, and I think you've actually said something really important there. We do that in that comparison game, that performance game. We are trying to make ourselves look better than others. And what's crazy is Paul said that's not true, Ephesians 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of works so that no man may boast. It's not about you. Stop it. And that's exactly what you're saying. And I, I'm going to have to give that a lot of thought and even reevaluate my own life now. That, that's really, that's really thought-provoking. As I think some more about it, though, when we talk about works, we talk about living a life pleasing to God. It, it almost seems to be in contrast with what we're saying about salvation by grace through faith. But yet we know James said, faith without works is dead. So how does that work with this grace-based salvation? I think it's talking about life transformation. So if you have accepted Jesus in, into your heart, your life is going to transform. Your behavior is going to transform. And yes, sometimes that appears as works, but it's, it's critical that um, you have life transformation because without it, you're not transformed mm. or, you know, it's chicken versus the egg, which came <laughs> first. I get that. And you can go in circles. But basically for me in working with people, until I see some life transformation, some change in behavior that's not works-based, it's just there has to be some kind of change take place for me to feel comfortable that um, uh, you're actually saved and, you know, we want people to grow, and part of growing is, a key part of growing is life transformation. And when your life transforms, you change. Kara, what do you think about that? Well, I would say then that's verbal faith. So faith that consists of words without actions, it's insufficient, right? Faith alone can't save, serve, or survive. So hmm. you think about how everyone profits when the love of God abides in the believer and then is expressed through those good works. Mm. So, you know, James also asked that question, can faith save him? A faith that does not demonstrate itself in works is not genuine. Right. It's a dead faith. And, you know, I quote Ephesians 2 a lot, and it's probably, I guess, at this point, my life passage. And if I ever got a tattoo of a verse or verses, it would probably be Ephesians 2 because it just makes it so clear. Like Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, really to me settles so many debates about faith and works. But Ephesians 2 says, For by grace through faith you've been saved, not of yourselves. And then in 2 10 it says, You are God's masterpiece, save for good works which Christ prepared beforehand for you to walk in them. That's it. Saved by grace. You are being transformed to live in a way that is pleasing to God. That's how you're saved, and there's the evidence. Case solved, problem dismissed. Let me say this. Is it wrong? <laughs> yes. You know, I, I mean, I would say sometimes I question my salvation. And I know that's stupid to do because I know I'm saved. My salvation is secure, but I think this is just normal. Sometimes we do that, but I do look back and I say, and I think, no, I'm okay. This is this sounds bad, but I, but I go, you know what? I was pulled to do this, and to to want to tell this person about Jesus. Or I was telling you a story off the air, Nat, about how I felt this pull to want to be around other believers, and so I met my friend Ashley through that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's evidence 
of being saved. Right, right. And I find so much comfort in that. This is a hard topic, but it's really quite simple. I, I, I've, I've really come to terms with that. You know, we've tried to create a formula for salvation. Um, a, if you do this, then this you know, follows. You know, Arnie and I and you, we've talked about you know, the sinner's prayer, saying a prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, these concepts that you, you don't find in the Bible as salvific methods, but they're reflective of a process we go through. And, you know, people have asked me, you know, when were you saved? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I remember at four, wrestling with uh, sin, and I remember not wanting to be separated from my mom in hell. And so guess what? I asked Jesus into my heart, and I was on a trajectory. But then from about 2021 20, till about 23, 24, man, if, if I looked like a, or if I was a Christian, I was in by the skin of my teeth, right? I mean, there was no evidence. I would go to church on Sunday, but I'd go in red-eyed, you know, from the night before. And I basically turned my life into hell, almost jeopardizing my marriage in, in the process. But there, be, there came this point, I remember the night where I'm sitting in my living room by myself with a, with a with a what they call it a pack and a pound a six pack of tacos and a pound of Frito Olays or whatever they call them, and I remember just going, "Whoa, I screwed it up. I messed it up. I believed a lie, and something began to change in me." And my wife, she said, "Nat, you're not." Who God has called you to be. I don't know if you're, I don't know what the deal is. I don't know, you know, where you are with Christ, but you're not living like a believer. You're not living like you should be. You've got a choice to make and you need to decide. And it was in that, that moment and in that wrestling that I realized, holy smokes, I'm really a sinner in need of a savior. And something flipped. Now, was I saved at age four? I don't know. I, I don't know. Was I saved at 23, 24, wrestling with the sin? Maybe, maybe not. But at some point in this process, I began to really understand my depravity, my total need for a Savior because I couldn't save myself. I began to have true repentance and remorse over my sin. I knew that the Holy Spirit was living inside of me. And though I still sin then and I still sin now, it is clear to me that Christ is driving my life. It is clear that the Holy Spirit is in me, convicting me and shaping me and molding me. But to become so, hey, we got to look for this defining moment, I think can be almost problematic, but rather it's a process. And, 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 and though salvation is in a moment, justification does happen, we don't see this necessarily Jesus saying, hey, you know, ask me into your heart. But they followed him, they observed him, they watched him, they walked with him. And then at some point, we don't know when, it became real for Peter. You know, it became for some of the other apostles, for James. And, and I think a lot of people's walks are like that. We don't necessarily know when to point back to, but at some point it becomes very real. And we find that evidence and the outflow of that salvation, the outflow of loving God is obediently following him no matter where he calls us. So really, Nat, you're saying that your accountability partner, your wife, saved your butt. Saved my butt and possibly even saved my soul. Wow. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. As we wrap up today's study, remember to request the latest issue of Win the Day. This month's edition features devotions to help you walk in truth and peace. We're excited to send you a copy as a thank you for your gift to Back to the Bible. Just call 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or visit backtothebible.org. Pastor Nat here. As always, let me encourage you to stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Join us again tomorrow.